Okay, in this example, we're going to start using the law of cosines in addition to the law of sines. So I've, I've actually just chosen an even numbered problem, number 20, from section 7.3. We're given this information. We're given one angle and two sides. Now, I like to have a picture, so I'm just going to draw a triangle. I don't know if this is what my triangle looks like, because when I only have this much information, don't really have a good sense of how big the other angles are going to be. So... 28.3 is a small angle, so I'll make it be a small one. But I really don't know, so I'm going to just label this as not to scale. I just kind of like to have a place to put my information. So if this is angle C, this would be side C. I'll just make that A and B. So this would be side A, which is 4.21, and this would be side B, which is 5.71. Both of those are in inches. Okay, and we're going to solve this triangle. And although I didn't actually write it down, we're going to include the units. We're going to round to the appropriate number of significant digits. Okay. Now, I have promised you two things about Chapter 7 and the final exam. One, there will be a question on the final exam that will require either law of sines or law of cosines or both. Okay. Two, I will help you out by giving very explicit directions, telling you which law you need to use for each part of the problem. Okay. So here I'm telling you that we're going to first of all find side C and for that we're going to use the law of cosines. Then we're going to find angle A and for that we're going to use law of sines. And then we're going to find angle B. Anytime we're finding the third angle we're just using the fact that the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Now as we work through this I will give you my thought process for why we're doing things in this order and why I'm choosing law of sines versus law of cosines and, and vice versa at the various steps. There is a table on page 316 of your textbook that goes through all of the different scenarios of what pieces of information you could be given and what order you need to do the various steps in. So this would be the situation where we know one angle and two sides and where the angle that we know is in between the two sides that we know. Okay. And that's going to involve first using law of cosines to get a side, then using the law of sines, and then using the sum of the angles. Okay. So you can use that as you're going through the homework. You can expect to have very explicit directions on the final exam. Okay. But I will be talking through my reasoning for why I'm doing things in this order. So it's good to understand that. I'm just recognizing that this is a lot at the very end of the semester. So I'm trying to make it a little bit easier going into the final. Okay. All right. First thing I'm going to do here is just create a table where I list these numbers and then the number of significant digits. So 28.3 degrees, that's going to be three significant digits. Two for the degrees, one for the extra digit. 5.71 inches is three. 4.21 inches is also three. So it looks like we're going to be rounding things to three significant digits. Okay, so with this information, I have to start with law of cosines because I can't use law of sines unless I know at least one pair of an angle and the side opposite it. The only angle that I know here is C and I don't know the side opposite it. I don't know A or B, so there's no pair that I have that I know, so I can't use law of sines. So I pretty much have to start by using law of cosines. So we'll say c squared is a squared plus b squared minus 2ab times cosine of the angle c. Now I'm going to just plug in. So c squared is 4.21 squared plus 5.71 squared minus 2 times 4.21 times 5.71 times cosine of 28.3 degrees. Now C is going to be the square root of this mess. <laughs> okay? I'm not going to bother to write it again. Okay? I'm going to tell you how I'm going to enter it into my calculator, but all calculators are a little bit different, so you want to practice with the calculator that you're going to use for the calculator part of the final exam so that you know what features you do and don't have. Okay. All right. So I'm going to just calculate what C squared is first. So I make sure I'm in degree mode. And then it's 4.21 squared plus 
5.71 squared minus 2 times 4.21 times 5.71 times cosine of 28.3. Okay, so I get 7.996 blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's this long number. I don't want to copy down all of those digits. But I also don't want to round before I take the square root. Okay. So my calculator has a really neat feature. I'm going to hit the square root key, and then I'm going to hit the answer key. It says ANS. So I haven't cleared out. I've still got that 7.996 blah, blah, blah going on. I hit square root of the answer. And what it does is it plugs in that previous answer into the square root. And so I'm getting 2.82779 blah, blah, blah. We'll round in a moment. Okay. Now, not all calculators have that feature. Okay. The other thing you could do is you could type in, once you've got this number, the 7.9 blah, 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 taking the square root is equivalent to taking things to the 1 half power. So you could use your exponent key, type in the exponent is 0.5. That will also allow you to get the square root of the number that you've just calculated. Okay. I recommend that over typing in all in one line the square root of then this entire mess. If you do that, you would need to have parentheses around this entire expression, and it's easy to lose track of things when you start having to enter in things with parentheses. Okay. All right, so now I want three significant digits. This number is five or bigger, so we're rounding up. So I'm going to just record my answers up here. That means C is going to be 2.83 if I round up, and that was inches. Okay, now I'm going to find angle A next using law of sines. It's actually very important that I find A next and not B, okay? That's because I can tell that angle A is smaller than angle B. Okay. I can tell that angle C is smaller than angle B because I now know that this side is 2.83. Okay. So remember, the biggest angle is opposite the biggest side. The difficulty is in a triangle, the biggest angle doesn't have to be acute. It could be right if we happen to be working with a right triangle, or it could be obtuse. If it's obtuse, I'm not going to get that from law of sines because if it's obtuse, it would land in quadrant two. Sine is positive, but sine of an acute angle is also positive. So if I know that the sine is some positive number, I don't know whether I'm talking about an acute angle or an obtuse angle. With law of cosines, cosine of an obtuse angle is going to be negative. Okay cosine of an acute angle would be positive. So law of cosines works better in that case. I can use law of sines if I know I'm looking for an acute angle. I know A is acute because it's not the biggest angle. Side B is bigger than side A, so angle B is bigger than angle A. As long as I know that A is acute, or A is not the biggest angle, I know it's acute, then it's safe to use law of sines. <laughs> Now, technically, it would be better to use law of cosines again because that way I could use only the given information and not use this value that I just calculated. Okay. However, law of sines is so much more convenient than law of cosines that the book sets the example that they use law of cosines once and then they switch to law of sines using the calculated value that you got from the first step. So since the book sets that example, I will allow you to follow that example. Okay. okay, so if I want to find A, I'm going to say A over sine A is equal to, and it has to be C over sine C, because I now know C and side C and angle C, but I still don't know angle B. Okay. All right, so now I know A, that was 4.21 over sine of A is going to equal C, we just solved for, was 
over sine of C is going to be sine of 28.3 degrees. So I can cross multiply. So I'm going to get that this diagonal product, so 4.21 times sine of 28.3 degrees, is equal to this diagonal product, 2.83 times sine of A. So now I can solve for sine of A. Sine of A is 4.21 times sine of 28.3 degrees over 2.83. So, I'm going to solve for sine, okay, so 4.21 times sine of 28.3, I know I'm still in degree mode because I didn't change it after I did part one, and I made sure I was in degree mode then, divided by 2.83. Okay, so I've got 0 0.705, blah, 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 but that's sine of A, I need to know A. Now here's the other reason I'm glad I'm working with A, which I know is acute, because acute angles are in the range of inverse sine. Obtuse angles would not be in the range of inverse sine. Okay. So if I'm using law of sines, I really want to know that I'm working with an acute angle. Okay. But now I can say that means that A is going to be arc sine of this number that I just calculated. So I've still got it on my screen. I'm going to use that nifty answer key that I have. If you don't have that, you might need to just write down, even though it's writing down a whole bunch of digits, write what they are and plug them back in. So make sure you know how your calculator works. In order to do inverse sine, I need to hit the shift key first. A lot of the keys that you have like, for example, if I look at the sine key on my calculator, it says sine on the key. Above the key, it says sine inverse. That means if I hit shift, or on some calculators it's second, it's going to go to that function, whereas if I don't, it'll do the first function, which is what's on the key. So, I hit shift sine, hmm, there we go, and on my calculator it actually now says sine inverse, it says that on the calculator screen, and then I'm going to hit answer, and I'm going to get 44.85, blah, blah, blah. We're rounding things to three significant digits. So since that digit is five, we would round up. So this would be about 44.9 degrees. Okay. All right, once I've got that, now I can find B. And here I'm going to just use the fact that the angles have to add up to 180 degrees. So I can say 44.9 degrees plus 28.3 degrees plus B is equal to 180 degrees. Let's see if I add these two together. That's 73.2 degrees plus B equals 180.0 degrees. I'm just going to add in that extra place holding zero. Remember, 180 is considered to be an exact number. Okay. So B is going to equal, let's see, we're borrowing here. 10 minus 2 is 8, 9 minus 3 is 6, 0. B is 106.8 degrees. Now, that does have four significant digits, but I got B by just using addition and subtraction. And remember, the rule when you're just using addition and subtraction is that I don't care how many digits it is, I care about the place value. Since the measured angles were to the tenths place, this measured angle is to the tenths place as well. And actually, oh, I misspoke a minute ago. That actually still has just three significant digits because it was degrees. 
Remember the rule for degrees is however many digits you have to the left of the decimal, it counts as two significant digits if it's degrees. So that's two and then one more. So that actually is still three significant digits. And more importantly, it's to the tenths place, which is the same place as those measured angles that I used. 